Welcome, everyone. I'm Sandra Bargeman. A few years ago, I wrote and performed a solo show called The Edge of Every Day, which was an exploration of the rough edges and contradictions we all face and grapple with. The show hit a nerve, and the relevance of the topic would only grow over time more than I could have foreseen. So, here we are. Real talk with real people, sharing stories and perspectives that spark provocative invitations to leap out of what's safe, on the edge of every day. Thanks for listening. Hello, everyone. We are live in the hive. Thank you for joining me on this, the third episode of The Edge of Every Day, here on talkradio.nyc. For those of you who are tuning in for the first time, and for those of you who don't know me yet, I encourage you to check out my bio and talkradio.nyc, or of course, visit my website, sandrabargeman.com. Or the best would be to tune in to the replay of my debut episode, where I shared where I'm from, the work that I do, and the inspiration for this podcast. In a nutshell, it's a show about pushing boundaries, and exploring rough edges. Through conversations and shared stories with friends and colleagues, it's my hope that we can begin to understand our edges. And what I mean by edges is those places where we are fearful, those places where we are resistant to change, those places where paradoxes and contradictions live in our beliefs and our understandings, both internally and collectively in the world around us. Listen, we live in edgy, challenging times, but life isn't black versus white. It's an embrace of both. And the more we recognize our own edges and get real about them, the more we can help others to do the same. And that, I fully believe, can help to change the world. So thanks for tuning in. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our guest this evening. Rob Warnoff has worked with children, youth, and families for over 30 years and is a nationally recognized expert on issues facing young people growing up in the foster care system. Some of the organizations with which he has worked and or consulted include the Child Welfare League of America, the U.S. Departments of Justice and Health and Human Services, the American Bar Association, Georgetown University's Center for Juvenile Justice Reform, National Court Appointed Special Advocates, the Human Rights Campaign, and many others. He has provided training and technical assistance to thousands of social workers, foster parents, and foster youth, attorneys, and law enforcement and corrections officials in nearly every state. Rob holds a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree from the Drama School at Carnegie Mellon University and a Master of Science degree in Human Services Program Development from the University of Massachusetts, where he also taught program performance monitoring and evaluation at the university's Graduate School of Community and Public Service. As an actor, Rob performed in productions for Lincoln Center, the New York Shakespeare Festival, Goodspeed Opera House, The Guthrie, and many others. He was a consulting producer on the Emmy-nominated documentary, Transformation, about transgender youth for MTV Docs. And currently, he is writing a pilot script for an hour-long TV drama series entitled Phoenix Rising, which he is developing with Tiffany Haddish, and Blair Underwood in order to shed a more positive light on the experiences of foster youth and those who work to support them. Welcome, Rob Warnoff. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you. Yay! Oh, I love that background. That's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. almost like attending your own funeral, you know, when you hear that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh. I am so excited to have you here. Thanks. Thank it's you so much. You too. And I am so excited to have you share your extraordinary journey. So uh, let's dive in. Sure. I, of course, I want to start with how we met. And I think that's, I think 
pretty obvious that we met in college at Carnegie Mellon University. And, yeah. but, uh, but we didn't really know each other too well. We did some shows there together. And of course, we're friendly. But then we became besties and like an old married couple when we lived together in New York City in our early days. In a one bedroom apartment. <laughs> in a one bed. Thank you. In a one bedroom apartment. Oh, you know, you just you just do what you need to do. Oh, yeah. In fact, Rob lived with me. Um, when I met my husband and first started dating him um, so many years ago. But uh, yeah. That guy was a keeper we, from day one. Uh, a keeper. And what did you say about him? I remember when I first met him, I thought he looked, he was like Richard Gere, but with muscles. Yeah, and Richard I think Gere. he was doing like some construction work or something at the time. Right? Well, he, was at the, he was in between grad, um, masters, his masters and grad school. Exactly. And he was doing some construction for it. Yeah, totally. Yeah, and I, but I I'll never forget like, what you said after, after he left. <laughs> he makes my palms sweat. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Plus when he told me he was an ornithologist and I went, what? And he said, I, I know birds. And I said, no, I know what an ornithologist is. Like, right. oh, ornithologist. Because <laughs> I thought he was like some muscly construction guy. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. Gorgeous. Gorgeous and wonderful human mm -hmm. like you. So, okay, we're going to dive right in. Um, you had um, a very loving, we're going to start with your childhood. You had a very sure. loving um, relationship with your family, particularly mm -hmm. your parents, of course, mm -hmm. your whole family, and both as a person who wanted to become an artist, a creative young person, as well mm -hmm. as a, a gay person. Mm -hmm. And you were complete. How was that? Tell me, did you know you wanted to go into acting early on? Were you, you know, oh, performing yeah. in shows early? And, you know, and how was that life for you as a young person? Yeah, I mean, I think like in sixth grade, maybe I did my first show and was totally, you know, bit. Um, my mom said she should have known I was gay when I did like a 10th or 11th grade paper on Barbara Streisand for high school. <laughs> Because not a straight kid in the world does that. So, <laughs> uh, oh. so yeah, I just, you know, and, and I mean, as you know, right, when you tell somebody you want to go tell parents you want to go to drama school, a lot of parents try to talk you out of it. My parents oh. were like, great, as long as you can pay for it, because they didn't have any money. But, you know, I worked my way through. It was fine. Um, but no, they could not have been any more supportive of any of all four of us. There are four kids. We all went in vastly different directions. I have a, a sister who's a retired colonel in the Air Force, another who's an acupuncturist. My brother's an attorney. We've all gone in very different directions, um, but our parents were just amazingly supportive uh, every step of the way. So yeah, that's, that's that. glorious. And people who go into child welfare either try, <laughs> sometimes either come from the kinds of family I had and believe all children should have that right? A good, you know, loving, stable, supportive family that loves unconditionally, uh, or they come from really messed up backgrounds and want to make it better. You know, those are sort of the trajectories. In. Incredible. And, 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 you know, it's possible. So you want to model it and we're going to dive into that yeah. a little later. So, right. so, so you're in New York, we finished school and you go to, we, we moved to New York and you have jump into this lovely, successful career on stage. Oh, yeah. And then you get into, you decide to do some volunteer work. Talk mm -hmm. to us about some this volunteer work that you decided to do that ended up changing your life. Yeah, sure. Because, you know, as an actor and as a gay man in New York City in the, in the 80s, right? I mean, AIDS was everywhere. Every single show I did, the next year someone would be dead. Um, my first show in New York, a uh, wonderful director named Steve. Uh, I went to Germany a couple of years later. I came back, called my answering service because we had those then. And they, said, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and they said, oh, there's a message from Steve Holtz. And I was like, oh, good. He's got another show. He's going to hire me again. And then they said, oh, the message is he died. And it was. It was oh, God, I remember this story. Remember that, right. So, you know, when you're in your 20s and, and, and your friends are getting sick and dying at such a rate, I thought I have to get involved somehow. Um, so I tried a bunch of different things during the day. You know, I had my days free because I was on stage at night and I, I, I did some phone tree work where we would do some activism, get on the phone and do some stuff. And then uh, when ACT UP, the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, uh, street mm. activism um, came up, I got involved in that. Uh, wow. But I can only kind of, my commitment was only just but so deep because we go to these demonstrations to, to rep, you know, to demonstrate against like unfair housing policies and, and access to healthcare and things like that. Uh, and I'd be in the streets with my fists in the air chanting, like, instead of going, act up, fight back, fight AIDS, I would be like, <laughs> I, thought, 
Save the voice. Save the voice. Save the instrument. Yeah, <laughs> save the instrument. But your energy was always there and committed. It was, it was. And then luckily, just by happenstance, I happened to do a play. I was sharing a house with a woman who had done the film of a Torch Song trilogy. Um, and the, which was one of the first kind of gay themed major films. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And the premiere of that film was going to be at Lincoln Center and it was going to benefit something called the Hetrick Martin Institute that I had never heard of. Um, but I went to the premiere and Harvey Firestein came out on stage before the film and said that Hetrick Martin had got a, a grant from the city to send people into schools, volunteers to do trainings, talking about like gay and lesbian issues, because at the time we only said gay and lesbian, we didn't really say trans and stuff then. Right. Um, and I looked at my former partner, who you knew, who neither one of us liked, and <laughs> well, we, we <laughs> I looked at him and he looked at me and we were both like, oh, you could do that, I could do that. Uh, so I literally picked up the phone the next morning, called Hedrick Martin, said, I'm an actor, I have my days free, I would love to train, and that is exactly how this uh, started. Wow, now did you have any inkling growing up and, and going through dramas at some point, you know, a, an attraction to working with youth, young people? Uh, I mean, kind of, I don't know. I was always so active in stuff. Like I was really active in Boy Scouts my whole life. You know, I was an Eagle Scout mm. and I loved scouting. I loved at the YMCA. I loved um, youth groups I was involved in, in in high school. So I guess, you know, but those were kind of peers. Um, right. But again, just kind of seeing you know, having the confidence to go out in the world like that, that I got from my parents. Um, and so I guess that was just kind of it. I had a kind of a strong social justice streak. Um, yeah, yeah, oh, well, you know, one thing though, maybe that influenced it. When I was 16, I remember saying to my sisters, you know, I can't really care about poor people because it's gonna be hard enough for me to become a movie star. So I literally said like crazy stuff like that. And my sisters were like, you can't think like that. But you know, went on my way. Anyway, the next year I applied to be an exchange student and whatever forces in nature plunked me down in Kenya, <laughs> in East Africa. Oh <laughs> and I'm living like in a hut made out of literally cow shit. <laughs> and, yeah. wow. and it was beautiful. Everything I learned about generosity, there's a word in Swahili called Harambe, which is come together, where people come together to, to build a school if the community needs a school or a Harambe hospital or housing. They do mm -hmm. that. In, 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 in Africa, in a way that we don't tend to do that here in America, right? So I always say everything I learned about generosity, I learned in Kenya. Um, so I was only 17 then, so that obviously took my oh, life. Completely influenced you, absolutely. So, so what, what, what was the moment where, where you were like, you know, how did you, how did you, you really connected to your desire to serve? Mm -hmm. Talk to us about the first time you went in and you you did this training. How did it mold you and grab you and really connect you to your service mentality? Thanks. Yeah, it was really, you know, we'd go into schools all around New York City. And, you know, at the time in the 80s, it was a very incendiary, incendiary issue, right? Oh, yeah. um, the, the school board, the school chancellor, if I remember, lost his job over this lost his job over sending people in to talk about like LGBT stuff. Um, wow. So it was a big issue, um, but the kids didn't care. They just wanted- Of course to they didn't, yeah. Exactly. Right, so that was the big thing. I was like, this is all the adults having all this drama. The adults just want to have a, con I mean, the kids just want to have a conversation. So I was in my early thirties by this point and they were high school kids. So I was an adult, but you know, not tremendously older than they were. Um, and the questions they would ask, and sometimes they'd be inappropriate, but they'd be funny. And it was all, they were always, whether it was in the Bronx. But real. Or, but real, exactly. They yes. just wanted to know the answer. And I got to kind of hone my skills. I did that for about three years of just volunteer training. Wow, um, I don't remember that, that it was that long. Wow, that's, that's long. fantastic. Did you yeah. do it all in one place? Did you all, travel all around? around? Uh, just in New York City, but everything from like Staten Island to, well, even beyond it to, uh, we went out to uh, Long Island a lot and all the five boroughs of, of Manhattan and all the schools. And it was, it was, it was fascinating. Um, and, and I remember that I, I was taking the subway train. I had done a really fun training in Brooklyn that day, taking the subway back to Hedrick Martin really furious sitting on the subway like fuming because i had just gotten a production of damn yankees and <laughs> which I, 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 had to, I had to cancel like the next two months of training to go do this show and i was so pissed that i had to cancel these trainings and i literally had a moment where i went what is that telling me if oh, i'm angry that's brilliant and that's perfect place to say because we've got to go to a, a a break and with this we'll pick it right up when we get back 
Great, thanks. Mm. Are you a business owner? Do you want to be a business owner? Do you work with business owners? Hi, I'm Stephen Fry, your small and medium-sized business or SMB guy. And I'm the host of the new show, Always Friday. While I love to have fun on my show, we take those Friday feelings of freedom and clarity to discuss popular topics on the minds of SMBs today. Please join me and my various special guests on Friday at 11 a.m. on talkradio.nyc. Are you a conscious co-creator? Are you on a quest to raise your vibration and your consciousness? I'm Sam Leibowitz, your Conscious Consultant, and on my show, The Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity, we will touch upon all these topics and more. Listen live at our new time on Thursdays at 12 noon Eastern Time. That's The Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity, Thursdays, 12 noon on talkradio.nyc. Are you on edge? Hey, we live in challenging, edgy times, so let's lean in. I'm Sandra Bargeman, the host of The Edge of Every Day, which airs each Monday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time on talkradio.nyc. Tune in live with me and my friends and colleagues as we share stories and perspectives about pushing boundaries and exploring our rough edges. That's The Edge of Every Day on Mondays at 7 p.m. Eastern Time on talkradio.nyc. You're listening to Talk Radio NYC. Uplift, educate, empower. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Sandra Bargeman, and my guest tonight is Rob Warnoff, and we're going to pick it up where we left off. So what did this incredible insight teach you? Yeah, it really was a moment that I went, my priorities have shifted. If I'm angry that I have to stop doing trainings to go do acting, which is what I loved, I thought was my first love, I realized I think it's now my second love. Um, and one of the reasons was, not only was I doing trainings in schools with kids, but Hedrick Martin worked with homeless kids, mostly homeless LGBT kids, mostly gay and trans kids uh, who were working around the piers in New York City. So if you watch the show Pose, uh, for example, those homeless kids who were kicked out of their homes for being who they are, those were the kids I was working with. So they would tell me their stories and started to kind of collect those and start to reflect on you know, my own lessons, because it wasn't only, I didn't grow up in a vacuum, none of us does, right? So like my best friend growing up, Greg, we were friends since we were kids, um, had the opposite home life, right? He, he had a stepfather who used to literally call him the little faggot in the house to his face. Like, hey, little faggot, go mow the lawn, seriously. And I would watch every time he did that, it was like a knife in Greg's heart, particularly when his mother didn't stand up for it. Right, And now we look back and go, she was a woman who didn't have a lot of job opportunities and she had three kids to support. She needed this jerk she was married to, right? So they wouldn't be homeless. Nobody blamed her. But at the time it confused him. And I saw the destructive behaviors in him and how I had this kind of force field of protection around me from my parents again, where he didn't have that. And I went, there's something to that, right? That's the variable. The link is the, the protection that people feel uh, yeah. if they're given it or not. The and safety. Exactly, safety. And Greg didn't have it, and the kids I was working with didn't have it. So that's when things really, really started to shift. Um, and I, uh, a little while later, I mean, I did have some other contracts I had to fulfill. I was up at Goodspeed Opera House, and I just read in the, the New York Times that the Massachusetts governor was about to convene this new governor's commission on gay and lesbian youth, is what it was called at the time. Um, and it was going to be run through the State Department of Public Health, and they were going to put money to develop programs to help homeless kids and bullying and, and things like that. Um, and I thought, that is what I have to get involved in. So I literally closed the times, called my agent, said, I have this show, one more show. Don't send me out anymore. <laughs> I'm going to Massachusetts. <laughs> and and I, I picked up the phone and I called the Department of Public Health. And I want to sort of backtrack a minute to, to a lesson I learned uh, from someone from school, 
where we went. So Billy Wilson, who was our glorious teacher, director, choreographer, uh, directed this production of, of Guys and Dolls, obviously, that you starred in and were magnificent in. Um, when we were auditioning for that show, I, I went and I sang for Billy and I, I had seen his shows. I had seen Bubbling Brown Sugar on Broadway and UB and, and I loved his, his shows. So I went in and I sang my first song, fully expecting I'm gonna be on the callback list. The callback list goes up and I'm not on it. And I was like, oh, wait a minute, I can do Guys and Dolls. So when the callbacks were happening, I hung out outside the studio. And when somebody came out, I slipped in. I don't know where I got the balls to do that, but I just did, I just slipped in and I was like, Billy, can I have another shot? Like, I wanna be on this callback list and he said, you're on the list. So somehow my name had just fallen off of it. And I apologized. And he said, don't ever apologize. <laughs> like, don't take no for an answer, right? Yeah. You see something you have to do and you feel strongly, do it. Do it. They're not going to suit you. They're not going to, you know, so. Yes. Um, so that was the lesson I took when I picked up the phone and I called the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. And I said, listen, I have a completely useless bachelor of fine arts degree in drama, useless outside. <laughs> <laughs> but this is why I think you should interview me. And, and I talked my way into an interview and, and I talked about uh, how I think HIV prevention was missing the boat at that point. They were talking about condom use among adult men, but I said, I think we need to talk about how we feel about ourselves based on our childhood, right? How our parents raised us using my example and my friend Greg's sort of juxtaposing the kids, the homeless kids I was working with in New York. Um, anyway, it worked. And I, I literally, I got the job. They gave me three and a half million dollars to develop programs. I didn't know what epidemiology meant at the time. I didn't know the yeah, difference. But you just knew you water. would rise to the occasion. You make it till you make it. <laughs> make it till you make it. Every actor's mantra. Exactly. So I studied hard and I picked up the public health lingo. Um, just skipping ahead a few years, did that for, for four or five, three or four years. Uh, but also working, still working with young people through this commission, now I would hear them say things like, as soon as I get HIV, I can get into a housing program. Kids would say that, I'm not kidding. As soon as I get HIV, I can get into a housing program. So I thought that was nuts. So I went to our director of housing services and said, do we have any kind of preventative housing, right? Can we get kids off the street before they become HIV infected? He said, no, we, we do treatment here. So I thought, well, you know who does prevention? Foster care. <laughs> So I picked up the phone again and I just called the biggest foster care agency in town. And I said, I want to transition from public health into child welfare, because for me, that's the first line of prevention. Kids need to be safe, loved, housed, cared for. Then they won't be as, at, as high risk. Uh, so that's what actually set me into the work, working into the world of child welfare, foster care. Um, wow, 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 wow. So then your next steps, you, you go to school. So everybody at the time assumed I had a master's degree. So I thought I should go get a master's degree. <laughs> so because I, you just walk with that social justice, that authority. I guess, and I learned big words like epidemiology. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, you're smart, uh, you who. It was also, um, you know, it was a two year program. I was working full time and I thought I was so far behind because in drama school, we didn't write papers, right? We didn't do any academic. We didn't read books. We had, you right. know, it's bad. It's Yeah, so fish. So I worked like crazy trying to catch up and didn't realize I was so far ahead that I finished the program in a year rather than two years. So, cause I thought I was behind. Fear is a great motivator. Ready to hit the ground running. Um, one quick little story. Uh, uh, I was planning a group home for, for LGBT kids. There had only been two in the country at that time, one in New York, one in LA and nothing opened since the eighties. This is early two thousands by this point pulled a whole group of people together to plan this thing. I designed it for about two years. We were ready to start the final planning, had about 30 people on board to do this planning. We scheduled the meeting for Tuesday morning, September 11th, 2001, is when the first meeting was supposed to take place. Obviously, wow. everything happened that day. The agency closed and sent everybody home, but no one on this planning committee went home. Everybody stayed at work because they said, no matter what's going on, kids still need a safe place to live. Yeah, there's still homeless people. Oh my God, wow. the dedication of those people was astounding. So we did open that home. Um, cut to a year or two later, I just was with my boss one day planning out the next year's work. And I said, I really, I want to start doing this work more nationally. And somehow I want to get the Child Welfare League of America on board because they were the biggest agency in the entire country dealing with the most influential. So I literally said, I want to get the Child Welfare League of America on board. 
go home, maybe a week or two later, whatever, I'm opening up my mail. There's a letter from the Child Welfare League of America saying they had just gotten three years of funding to start a national program working with LGBT youth and did they want me to direct it? And I was like, oh my. So, you know, when things are right, they just kind of fall into place, right? So I, I think we have to do some, some kicking down of doors at the beginning, but, but if they're the right doors and we walk through, <laughs> opportunities just keep unfolding. And then everything opened up from there. You know, having an organization like the Child Welfare League, we got states where it was very hard, like Arkansas and Alaska and Florida, um, you know, that were really struggling with a lot of these issues around LGBT kids. The first, first and foremost, they are kids. And everybody in foster care and child welfare gets that, right? Oh my. It's not politics, it's safety. Well, you just had such powerful energy. You know, you were taking powerful action and the universe just rose up to meet you. So tell talk to us about um, I'm not sure how much time we have left, but but I, I do want to touch on this before our next break. Um, what is the trajectory of um, do we can start with a homeless youngster, but but a foster care child in general, general. Or like what brings talk us through that that process. What brings a child uh, into foster care? Yeah. Or sure, yeah, there, there are a lot of trajectories. It's it's most mostly abuse and neglect, right? And and by abuse, it's not spanking, right? It's it's a lot of violence. Uh, so I have a quote here. I have a quote here that I heard you say: "Kids don't go into foster care for something they've done, although." they always blame themselves for that. Kids go into foster care for something an adult does. That's it, exactly, right? So we talk about, you know, we, we, we call them troubled youth or even, even foster kid, he's a foster kid. Well, no, he's a kid in foster care. <laughs> he's not a special kind of kid, right? Yeah. Um, so you're right, it's not, they don't come in because they did something wrong, it's something was done wrong to them by usually by somebody who's supposed to love and care for them. So it can be violence, it can be neglect if the parent's addicted or incarcerated, right? Mass incarceration forces ch the children of these people who were massively incarcerating uh, who have some place to live and then, then they go into foster care. Um, it, you know, again, it, it's, it's the neglect of the parent, it's the violence that the kids suffer. Um, sometimes it can be horrific, honestly, I've known, I, knew so, I know someone who's a clinical psychologist now whose mother pimped him out when he was six months old. I'm not kidding. Uh, it can be horrific, um, but the, but but the child has to live on, right? And has to go on and have a life and, and hopefully become an adult. So so what happens next? I'm always interested. I'm I'm not interested in what brings them into care. I'm interested in what kind of care they get once they're in, and then how do we help them get to the next place in their life? And I'll talk about this a little bit later on. But there are spectacularly successful people who mm -hmm. have come out of foster care, right, or who have been adopted um and by the way today is the the kickoff of national adoption month so we'll we'll touch on that too in a little bit but i love the the serendipitous timing of that yeah um, extraordinary so, so so how many you mentioned that there were uh 34 billion fo foster kids in foster or uh, oh no i'm sorry how many well, that's the money yeah. The, yes, that's the money, yeah. um, which we're going to get to in the next one. Uh, how many how many kids are in the foster care system now? It's over four hundred thousand, and that that amount has stayed steady. Or I always think a little more adjustable way to, to think digestible way to think about it is uh, it's about seven hundred kids every single day. Seven hundred oh, Rob every day come into care. Um, it's a lot. You know, it, it, again, you know, it, it's an outgrowth of poverty. It's an outgrowth of, of domestic violence, of addiction, which is, you know, again, outgrowth of poverty, uh, mass incarceration, um, yeah. you know, all these things affecting the adults. When children are involved, they are affected no matter what. Uh, and then their, their trauma starts, even if the trauma is, uh, you know, it can be the murder of a parent. You know, I, I, I worked with a young man once who watched his mother be murdered. Um, and you know the, the feeling of impotence that he had, he couldn't he couldn't save her. Save her. Exactly. And that's, of course he couldn't save her. He was a child. Yeah, and some and then to take that, of course, that blame and the shame of all of that mm -hmm. moving forward. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. uh, it is time for us to take another break, and we are going to when we return, we're going to talk about um, your personal experience mm -hmm. within the foster care system. Sure. 
Howdy, I am Joseph Franklin McElroy, host of the new podcast, Gateway to the Smokies. It airs on talkradio.nyc every Tuesday night from 6 p.m. to 7. Every episode is dedicated to memorable experiences in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park and surrounding areas. This show features experts and locals who expound upon the richness of culture, history, and adventure that awaits you in the Smokies. Tune in every Tuesday from 6 p.m. to 7 on talkradio.nyc. Are you passionate about the conversation around racism? Hi, I'm Reverend Dr. TLC, host of the Dismantle Racism Show, which airs every Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern on talkradio.nyc. Join me and my amazing guests as we discuss ways to uncover, dismantle, and eradicate racism. That's Thursdays at 11 o'clock a.m. on talkradio.nyc. Are you a small business trying to navigate the COVID-19 related employment laws? Hello, I'm Eric Sauber, employment law business law attorney and host of the new radio show, Employment Law Today. On my show, we'll have guests to discuss the common employment law challenges business owners are facing during these trying times. Tune in on Tuesday evenings from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern time on talkradio.nyc. You're listening to Talk Radio NYC at www.talkradio.nyc. Now broadcasting 24 hours a day. Chipping around, keep my brain to the ground. These are the days it never rains. And we are back. Welcome back to The Edge of Every Day. And we are talking with writer and child welfare advocate, Rob Warnoff. So let's dive into um, your experience with the um, foster care system. Um, the government, this is what I was thinking of. The government spends $34 billion on foster care, and we don't have enough foster parents. That's rather mind boggling. It's a it, it's huge, you know. Kids who when once they come into care, they need lots of support, right? They need mental health support. They they get, re ironically, really good health care. Um, but you know, all the social workers, all the therapists, all, all of the doctors, everyone, you know, the outreach workers, the people who are training the foster parents. Um, it, it's a huge machine to try to keep these kids housed. Um, because the scariest thing is when they become homeless after that, right? Getting someone off the street is a trajectory into the incarceration system or death um, a lot of times. Um, so yeah, there's a gigantic, very expensive machine, but it just shows that throwing money at the problem isn't the solution. It's not of, solving it. It's opening up people's hearts and, and homes. That's the only thing that's gonna solve it. And, and the changing the stereotypes. That's it, exactly, yep. And, and we're, gonna get, we're gonna talk to you uh, after this next break about mm -hmm. how you're working to change those stereotypes. But right. talk to us about about your your experience as a both a foster parent and as an adoptive parent or as i've learned foster adopt parent <laughs> oh yeah that's just kind of the license you get yeah so you know this is how amazing my dad was um when i came out and told him that i was gay he, the, the only question he had was he said does that mean you're not gonna have kids <laughs> I was like, no, no, I'm going to have kids. And he went, oh, good, then fine, <laughs> you know, just, which is sort of a rare response for a lot of fathers. I, I wish it weren't rare, but um, so, so I always, that was always part of my life trajectory was to, to have kids somehow. Um, I thought I would do it with a, a former partner uh, who I was with for many years. You know, at that point, um, you know, we owned a house, I had a good job, I had finished grad school late 30s it was time to have kids uh unfortunately his mother said uh something like we will never be your children's grandparents um, oh dear lord a child should never I hear remember that, that. insanity mm -hmm. so um that was sort of the end of that <laughs> um having children together with him and that ended our relationship anyway i'm getting into my 40s and i thought you know get on with it like either do it or don't 
Um, so I started the process. I called, I was living in DC. I called Child Family Services Agency. The, so people can get licensed through a private agency and pay for like private adoption, which is if you typically want a baby, right? A newborn, people go through private adoption um, or international adoption. Uh, they can go through a private agency. It costs a lot of money, but you know, yay. Um, I wanted older kids and I wanted, I was thinking of a sibling group of like four to six or seven or eight year old, four to eight year olds, mm -hmm. two to three kids. Um, you know, I thought if I'm going to do this as a single parent, they should be a little bit older. Maybe go yeah. to, uh, so. <laughs> well, and aren't they, aren't they generally speaking, isn't that a, a little more difficult? It's, um, it's, I mean, or is that even a stereotype? To, to keep siblings together or no to to um get, choose the older kids um it gets easier the older the kids get because fewer people want them right so we, the, the goal is really by around seven or eight to get yes. kids into permanent homes after that they, they they become sort of you know systematized right? yes exactly. their, their, their deep mistrust i'll talk about in one second but um so anyway, I, I called the city, got licensed through the city, uh, and because I thought there are so many kids in DC that need homes, and uh, yay, I wanted little kids. I finished my training, which I had trained foster parents, but I hadn't gone through the training. The training, right. Exactly. Fascinating. Really, really fun. It's about 30 some hours. Um, and you do CPR and everything. So great. And they inspect your house. They do a home study, and you write this whole history of your family. And I remember I was traveling so much in those years. I was I was writing everything on planes. And, um, so, and <laughs> I, I totally remember this. Remember that? And I was so clear with my social worker that I said I want you know four, five, six, seven, eight year old, little two little kids that age. And I went to something called a matching event, and that is where they bring kids out. And it was like holiday time, so the kids were all dressed up, and there's cakes and goodies all over the room and the kids are completely dressed and they're putting on their best for the foster parents who were there. It's sort of like puppies at the pound. I mean, it can kind of break your heart, right? The kids totally. going on, they're like, I, if I impress one of these people enough, maybe they'll take me home and run forever. Um, so I cried all the way there because <laughs> I knew I knew it all before. Um, and, and I'm watching these little kids and then I see this teenager just sitting all by himself. And I thought, Oh my God, I have to go talk to that kid because he's just, it's all these little kids. Um, he was 14, we hit it off. We started talking about tennis, which we found out we had in common. And that was, I think on a Sunday and by the next Saturday we were playing tennis together. And then we started uh, spending more time together. Um, and then he said, I wanna come live with you. And I was like, okay. So I called his social worker, my social worker. We had a meeting and I said, I guess I'm not getting little kids because DeAndre and I sort of really clicked and I and so then you do it you do like a, a few overnights right that's they always kind of try to see all right how's it going to be you spend a day together a few days and an overnight weekend just to kind of see so he said I want to move in and I said are, are there any concerns you have and he just said are you going to rape me and I went no why and he said because I heard that's what gay men do they rape kids and I thanked him and he said, why are you thanking me? I said, I thank, thank you for being so honest and so brave to ask that question. Because if you hadn't asked that question, we couldn't dispel what's called a stereotype. <laughs> and also I'd be wondering like, why is that boy always over the other side of the room? He never comes in. <laughs> but I also said, DeAndre, trust isn't anything you have to do. It's what I have to earn, right? I can tell you I'm not gonna hurt you, but he was 14, I was his 23rd placement. He had had 23 different homes by 14, right? So at this point, his social worker tried to tell me he had attachment disorder where he couldn't really attach. And I went, no, this boy can attach. That's a sociopathology. This isn't that. I said, he doesn't trust anybody. And not trusting anybody after 23 placements makes perfect sense. Completely, right. completely. So that was, that sort of started our relationship, which was really great for a long time. The only downside was I was traveling constantly and by constantly I mean two or three days a week out of state so I'd have to put him in what's called respite care I'd put him with a family who would take him for two or three days or a day or two then I'd come back to DC then he'd come home then back to respite care and I had to sit him down to say dude really like the only thing that you need is stability and it's like the only thing I can't offer because I have this sort of big national job of course he said you could quit your job oh. I loved my job and I loved him yeah. so um, anyway, we, I'm working we, on behalf of you. Oh, it was that, but it's hard to, you know, when you're just of a course, a fur child, of course, like of course, of um, course. And he just wants you. He's finally found someone he can trust. 
So we did, we stayed in each other's lives for a long time. He ended up um, uh, going to live with another family that did want to adopt him. By, by that point, I think he had just washed his hands. He wasn't sure he wanted me to adopt him either. You know, and he had even said, I wish I met you when I was eight and not 14. Yeah. Because he said, by, because by eight, I would have wanted to be adopted. He said, now I'm not sure, but let's see. Anyway, we were in each other's lives for years and years and years and years. I mean, talking all the time, even when I moved to California, I flew him out a couple of times, see him in DC. Uh, unfortunately, like many uh, foster kids who get out of the system without any support, um, he did end up on the streets and, and he's now incarcerated. And that's oh, Rob. common. But it's, you know, again, it's so many things were sort of ganged up against him. I don't think he really stood a, a shot. Um, so. so that's one part of it. Yes. The other, there was a, a young person who I had worked with, a foster kid back in Boston since she was a teenager. And we stayed in each other's lives throughout for years and years and years. Uh, and she did amazing, amazing things. And after about 20 years, when she was in her 30s, even a little before that, when Tom, my husband and I, we've been together about 10 years, I said, you know, there's somebody I've always wanted to adopt and I should have adopted her a long time ago, but we're still in each other's lives. And I hope people hear this, you can adopt grownups. <laughs> so yeah. once somebody turns 18, they can still be adopted. Um, so Tom said, let me get to know her first. So they spent a few years really developing a wonderful relationship. And then after she and I have been in, in each other's lives for over 20 years, we finalized our adoption. Uh, so we have her, you know, as a, a legal daughter, she just finished her master's degree in social work because a lot of foster kids go into social work because they want to be better than what they had. Yeah. Right? Brilliant. Uh, she's going to have a brilliant career. Um, and then just real quickly, I had an opportunity to be a birth parent to, uh, with two friends of mine who were starting a family who needed a donor. Um, so I got to be the donor for them. Uh, so I have these two little birth kids who are not my legal kid. I have a legal kid who's off doing her life. And then a foster ex-foster son who's incarcerated. So that's sort of my little family. Well, yeah, well, it's fantastic. Can you expand a little bit on your, your biological uh, children and, um, and the, the structure of this family is just so glorious and fascinating and it just so speaks about, about there's so many ways to have a successful family. And mm -hmm. I just love this story so much. I want you to share it, please, oh, or expand I'm upon it a bit. Thanks. Uh, sure. So their dad, their, their fully legal dad, uh, is an attorney I've worked with for years and years. He's done amazing work on, on social justice issues, particularly around LGBT kids who are incarcerated. Um, so we had traveled the country together. Uh, I knew his wife. I was at their wedding. Um, and because he's a trans man, that's why they needed um, a, a donor. Uh, and by this point, I'm in my 50s by this point, honestly, too old to have my own kids, right? I mean, it's... Well... box can handle that, mine can't. So... <laughs> Uh, so it's it's just this wonderful uh, arrangement because they're in our lives. We see them all the time. We're the uncles. Um, they will know as they get older. Um, in fact, the, the, the girl who's about to be nine next week told me four or five years ago, she said, my sperm came from you. Oh, my. But, well, okay. She's, so, she's really remarkable. She is remarkable. Yeah. She is remarkable. So uh, that's great. So they, they intend to... Uh, and and they intend to share all of this information more deeply. They do, and it sort of aligns with the shift in adoption as well. Adoptions used to be closed, so people couldn't have access to records. You didn't know who birth parents were. They didn't know medical histories. I've had friends who don't know what ethnicity they are um, because they have no idea. Adoption is much more open now. So uh, open adoption is, is when the birth parent or birth parents are, are much more involved because taking a child away from their birth parent, particularly their birth mom, is something called the primal wound. It does not heal, right? Even if the situation they're going to is better, it's their mother. They yeah. just have been there for nine months. Yeah. Um, so the whole idea of, of having a link to people's biological history, right? And as this very wise old character in an Amundsen Muppin book, Tales of the City said, we have our biological family and our logical family. Uh Brilliant. Sometimes those coincide, sometimes they don't, right? But it's really important for, for people to know their medical history, to know their sort of genetic lineage. Uh, oh, of course. It them from having to search a lot. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so we'll, we'll talk to the kids when they're older and they'll, they'll know that. So glorious. Well, that's a perfect moment for our break. And when we come back, we will speak with Rob about the project that he is undertaking now. Thanks. Mm -hmm. 
Hey everybody, it's Tommy D, the nonprofit sector connector coming at you from my attic. Each week here on talkradio.nyc, I host a program, Philanthropy in Focus. Nonprofits impact us each and every day, and it's my focus to help them amplify their message and tell their story. Listen each week at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time until 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on talkradio.nyc. Do you feel uninformed about menopause and how it impacts on your life? Hi, I'm Pat Duckworth, women's health strategist and host of the Hot Women Rock radio show, empowering women leaders at menopause. Join me every Thursday at 10 a.m. Eastern Time, 3 p.m. UK Time on talkradio.nyc for interviews with inspirational women who will share their top tips to rock your world. Do you run or are ready to open your own business? Hi, I'm Jeremiah Fox. I've been operating and opening small business for the last 25 years, and I'm the host of the new show, The Entrepreneurial Web. Tune in every Friday at noon Eastern time for insights and stories on the nuances of running small business right here on Fridays at noon, talkradio.nyc. You're listening to Talk Radio NYC at www.talkradio.nyc. Now broadcasting 24 hours a day. Chipping around, keep my brain to the ground. These are the days it never rains, but it falls on the edge. And we are back with Rob Warnoff. So let's dive in. Your latest project. Take it away. Thanks. Um, (laughs) (laughs) uh, One of the things I had to do in my work was write a lot, right? Write a lot of articles, write a lot of grants. And of course, you know, when we when we've done something, when we haven't done something before, we get afraid of it, right? So I didn't write a grant until I'd written one. I hadn't written an article since I wrote one, until I wrote one, right? You got to start someplace. Um, so writing became a huge thing for me. Um, I wrote a book on, on all the airplanes I was on called Little Secrets about uh, uh, all the young people I worked with who were so amazing, but people would, didn't know about them because they were secret, right? I mean, yeah. people were sort of invisible foster kids. Um, so I wrote that. Uh, there's actually a book I'm sketching out about my kind of parenting life called Daddy dot, 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 sort of. <laughs> <laughs> Sort of. <laughs> but after, you know, all these, these years of, of traveling around and meeting amazing, amazing kids in, 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 who were coming out of foster care, who were doing things like going to Columbia University and getting a degree in international politics and working for Congress, or a young man I worked with who had been homeless as a kid and not only became a lawyer, he was the ABA's Young Lawyer of the Year one year, right? I mean, you know, people like, I mean... Uh, uh, Steve Jobs, Gerald Ford, who was president, was adopted, right? Steve Jobs, uh, um, Tiffany Haddish, Cher, uh, Jamie Foxx, I mean, so many, Eric Clapton, so mm-hmm. many people were involved either in foster care or were adopted um, uh, that, you know, Simone Biles at the Olympics, right, talks about being in foster care. Uh, Frances McDormand was adopted, mm-hmm. out of foster care, right? So I'm like, how come no one tells those stories? Right. Every time I turn on the TV, it's the kids are all messed up. They're little criminals. That's why they went into foster care, which is wrong. The foster parents are usually sadists who are very nice to the social workers. And when the door closes, they become monsters. And I had met the social workers are crazy. And the social workers are crazy. Right. Right. All these stereotypes. Exactly. And all that does is make people watch and go, well, that's horrible. Why would I want to be a part of that? (laughs) But I thought that's not the reality. Right. Kids coming out of foster care are so resilient, that's the thing, right? How many young people could be removed from their parents, bounced around to a bunch of families, still maintain their grades, hopefully go to college or become you know, whatever they wanna be uh, with that kind of background, the resilience, the strength, right? And the, the persistence, right? Those are things we should be celebrating and, and yes. building, right? Um, same thing with foster parents. I've met foster parents who were the most loving, incredible people, uh, you know, foster kids can, based on their lives, can be, you know, it's rough, right? They've had rough roads. Um, and a lot of foster parents just hang in there through that rough ride, right? And, and social workers are not uncaring, they're overburdened. 
Yes, they indeed. Don't them, right? We don't pay enough taxes or we don't have enough money flowing in. And so they're, they have 40, 50 kids on their caseload when they should have 15 or 20. Um, yes. So everybody's trying their best. Anyway, I thought, how do we shift that narrative? And I would ride my bike and I would think about this and hike and think about this. And then one day I just thought, television can do that. So I thought, you know, we went to Carnegie Mellon. We know people who work in TV. So I called Blair Underwood, who was in my class at Carnegie, yeah. doing a lot of TV work. His sister is adopted and said, what do you think? What if we did a show that told different stories, told much more positive, much more encouraging, hopeful, inspirational stories? Um, so he said, would you move to LA? And I said, I'll move to LA if you want to work on this project. He said, I want to work on this project. So I moved to LA. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. And I started... Uh, I wasn't going to write the pilot, but we met a producer who had written a bunch of successful cop shows. And he said, I was a cop. I didn't know TV writing. I wrote cop stories. He said, you know what this is. Write it. So I got books and I learned how to write scripts and I started writing scripts and we couldn't sell it at the beginning because I networks yeah. are the foster kids. Right. I had the very idea. reason for the show. Exactly right. But they were like, oh, that's people don't want to see kids being hurt. And I said, I'm not going to show kids being hurt. I'm going to show them healing after the hurting. Um, I had one exec who was producing one of the biggest shows on television that was about rape, torture, torture, murder every single week. And he told me foster kids were scary. <laughs> and I went, did you hear what you just said? Yeah, right. Rape, murder, and torture. Hmm. Irony. Exactly. So we had a little bit of trouble kind of getting it off the ground, just getting interest in it. Anyway, I put it away for a little while, but I kept working on it. Um, and then Blair happened to be doing a, a TV series, a limited series with Tiffany Haddish who is just so brilliant and so amazing and came out of the foster care system, again, through no fault of hers. Her mother was in a very bad car accident. Her mother was not an abusive woman until she was in a very bad car accident that damaged her brain. Then she became violent. So, but for that car accident, Tiffany wouldn't have been in foster care, right? It's a good example of- Wow, fascinating. I right? did not know that, yeah. So I just texted Blair and said, hey, Tiffany was a foster kid. Do you think she want to get involved with this project? I know she's very committed. He wrote me back. Can I swear? Yes. <laughs> this is an adult show. <laughs> he wrote back about five minutes later. He said, this is her exact text. Fuck yeah. <laughs> so once that happened, we got her production company on board, her amazing production executive, um, the, the, her agency. Uh, they have now paired me with some uh, incredible, an incredible writer who writes for uh, 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 Shonda Rhimes shows. Mm. So worked on How to Get Away with Murder all the years that was on. Uh, he, and as he says, if we can sell a, ser you know, a sociopathic serial killer, <laughs> we can sell foster kids. Um, he's on Bridgerton now. He's brilliant. His name's Daniel Robinson. Because um, I said, I'm, I'm a good writer, but I need a great writer, right? I need someone who's actually written for television. So we're working together on this. We're gonna co-create the show. Um, it's called Phoenix Rising. We have developed all these characters. It takes place in a, in a big foster care agency and we can work, we can look at from different lenses. Mm. Uh, the lead character is actually an African-American straight man like in his late thirties, early forties because in all my years I've met maybe three straight black guys who became social workers. <laughs> Um, it's just not it's an industry that, you know, and I thought, well, that's yeah. interesting, right? Um, let's, and so we've loaded him with backstory uh, about being in foster care himself and rising to the top of the economic food chain and how that's, that's not just status for him, that's protection, right? So what happens if he starts with these kids and has to rip that scab off every day, that hurts. And is he going to be brave enough to face that hurt or run back to his nice, safe life? Um, so everything in the show sort of bring comes back to trauma. But again, what happens next is not the trauma, it's the healing, right? It's not the harm, it's the resilience. Uh, it's the forgiveness. Um, so in fact, there's an actor we're talking to about being attached as the lead who was raised in foster care. And he said, I heard him on a TV interview once where he said he had a horrible, horrible adoptive mother who used to torture him. And he said, if I didn't forgive that lady, I couldn't be a father to my own son. So he said, I had to learn to forgive her so I could be a good parent. And I went, that is exactly what Phoenix Rising is about. It's about forgiveness, healing. Um, you know, where do young people get to? Where do the families get to after that bad thing that happens? Yeah, right? the extraordinary edge for them. That's it. The, the al alchem uh, alchemical union of those opposites, the, the trauma of what they've gone through with the resilience and the power and the, the inspiration that they bring. So combining those two. Yep, exactly. So we want to tell stories of, 
you know, it's going to be set up sort of like Grey's Anatomy, right? Where our social workers will be what the doctors on that show do, right? right? Excellent. Oh, cool. Yeah. And so we'll get to know their stories and dispel yeah. those stereotypes and exactly. dispel the foster parents' stereotypes. Exactly. So the whole system and, and the whole brand new understanding woven through it all of the entire system yeah. and how that might inspire people to get involved. And this is a brilliant seg into my last question. Uh, question is you know this is all about moving people to take action to educate them and move them to take action so how do i if i'm listening in and i move to action how do i get involved in the foster care system what are the many ways that i can do that and get going sure so every single state has a state agency state social service agency um uh every county every city it's all localized so you can call your local city agency um I have some websites I think I sent you. So like the, mm -hmm. the Child Welfare Information Gateway is a great clearinghouse. Um, or Adopt Us Kids, which is a play on Adopt US Kids, right? Adopt Us Kids. Um, they have profiles of kids all over the country. Um, so there are all kinds of ways people can get involved. You can be a foster parent or a foster adopt parent if you want to, mm -hmm. adopt, right? Um, um, so they get, you know, they, you get trained and then you get kids placed with you and if it clicks, right? And, and sometimes that magic happens and it's, and it's just absolutely wonderful. But there are all kinds of other ways to get involved too. There's something called CASA, Court Appointed Special Advocates. I love this organization. It's a national nonprofit and they, you work with one kid at a time and you are their advocate. So you work with their social worker, their attorney, their therapist, their judge, right? Having some consistency there, being a mentor, being a volunteer. Yes. Um, when I ran an agency out here in Palm Springs, we, this was for older kids. So they didn't need help with things like tutoring, but they wanted to go hiking yeah, <laughs> or things like that. So, you know, a lot of times I couldn't spare the staff. So we had volunteers and those volunteers all have to have background checks and things like that. That's, you know, of course, um, of course, but there are tons of ways. And even for newborns, right? A baby's born, say they're born addicted. They're removed from the mom. They can't just sit in the they hospital. Hold them. Exactly right. To hold them oh. and give them over. Um, there's Beautiful. a, a very successful TV writer, Dawn Presswich, who's written tons and tons of TV shows. She was an emergency placement foster mom. So she would take those kids at their most vulnerable, have them until they get stabilized and then send them on their way. Um, wow. It's another way to get involved. Terrific. Well, Rob Warnoff, this has just been so enlightening and so inspiring. Your story is so moving, so inspiring, so uplifting. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being on wow. my show. Was it? Thank you for doing this. Aboard. <laughs> and, and thank you to everyone that's listening in. Again, you can find Rob on his LinkedIn um, um, on social. Um, the another, I wanted to mention a couple of um, websites that I also went to that are helpful. Um, Fostermore.org mm -hmm. was a terrifically informative. I'm part um, of it. That was started by the guy who was the Young American Bar Association Young Lawyer of the Year. He started that, David Ambrose. Amazing, amazing. And childwelfare.gov. Um, so visit those websites, check Rob out on social. Uh, remember next week, our time is 7 p.m. That's our new time slot. Keep that in mind next week. You can find me at sandrabargeman.com or uh, of course at talkradio.nyc. And remember, we live at the edge of the miraculous. And on that note, thanks again, Rob Warnoff, my dear friend, and thank you all for tuning in. I'll see you next time.